we've been having a, a lot of fun this year talking about uh, things out in far outer space, how to get there, the amount of energy it would take to get to places, uh, what's out there if we go out there, and, and so on. And we've got our resident uh, physicist emeritus from Fermilab, Scott uh, and Mike Albro, wanted to talk about about uh, exoplanets and what life is like or what things are like out there and how they could or couldn't support life. So without any further ado, thanks for coming in today. I'll bring Mike and I've wired him up so he can walk around a bit and uh, feel free to be here at the podium or wherever Thank you. Do you hear me? The first of this paper, uh, I'm, I'm not responsible for this horrible font. That I <laughs> it's an exoplanet, but uh, that wasn't what I saw. I thought it just come out from that computer anyway. Uh, so that's uh, it's an exoplanet. I think the rest of the sort of size is probably okay, but we'll see. Yeah, so uh, this is a picture of Fermilab, where I've been working. I came there 27 years ago. I retired a couple of years ago, but I'm still going in because I'm still addicted to this science stuff. And uh, uh, in a couple of so one thing, if you haven't been there, you should go. And the first Sunday of every month, there's a public lecture at one o'clock. That's called Ask a Scientist. And afterwards, you can go around and meet some science physicists and ask questions and so on. And an advert is that the first one in March, on March 3rd, I'm giving a talk, and it's going to be about great women physicists and astronomers, which is a very topical sort of thing. Uh, but I'm an experimental physicist, not an astronomer, professional astronomer. So, so why am I talking about this? But if you were to Google Michael Albro planets, this is what you might find. Planet under Michael Albro, Radio New Zealand. <laughs> Sir Professor Michael Albro, senior lecturer in astronomy at the University of Canterbury, the planet hunter. That's not me, actually. <laughs> I, I, I talked to him, I said, why don't you come to Birmingham and give a colloquium about this? And people will wonder what's Michael Albro doing talking about this. But um, I, I was a planet hunter when I was a kid. And uh, forgive me if I show a few things from my love book that I had when I was 13 um, in 1957. And these are quotes from my log. Um, uh, January 10th, I did not expect to see Mercury this morning as it will not be in a favorable position for a week. And although I looked, I did not see it. You should write down negative observations as well. Right? <laughs> Venus itself was silvery bright about 3.5 degrees above the southeast horizon. January 27th, a, week later, a few weeks later, I, I found Uranus as a magnitude 5.5 star, I call it a star, west of Presepi, which was a, a cluster of stars. So it was in opposition two days ago. And these, I drew, I had a little telescope that I sort of made and drew his Jupiter, drawing Jupiter with its four moons, the Galilean moons. And these are day after day some diagrams. This is a picture I drew of, of Venus through my telescope. It never looks like that at night because you see, the sun would be up in this direction, shining on that, so it's upside down, and my telescope was actually inverting things, that was the way it was. And this is what I could see about Saturn, I said, very exaggerated sizes. 1957 was a very special year, because not only was it the year of Sputniks, by the way, I told Mike to, if I speed up too much, slow me down, okay, wave an S sign or something like that, the Sputniks came up, and that was very exciting, you could actually see them going across the sky, and that was a really exciting time. And also, it's a year of two bright comets, which is very unusual. And this is Comet Alan Rowland. And this is a drawing I did in, in my logbook. I did night after night, I could see it, naked eye. Uh, this is April 24th. And I just found out recently that April 24th, 1957, was the first emission of a program called Sky at Night on the BBC. There were only two channels of TV in those days in England. And Patrick Moore was a young teacher that started broadcasting and writing books. And who's heard, has anybody heard of Patrick Moore? You might, if you, if you were in England, you probably, in our age, you would have done, because that program was so popular in a half a country, and it went, it's still going on, and he hosted it for over 50 years until he died, he hosted that. So I think he's the longest running TV presenter of the program ever. It was very popular, he was very charismatic. Half an hour every month about something going on in the sky. Anyway, and, uh, and he lived not far from me, and I could cycle around to his house, and he let me look through his backyard telescope and so on. He passed me my boy scout the astronomer badge. It was really wonderful to have such a great guy nearby. And then there was a journal of the Junior Astronomical Society, which I was a member of, and I sent my observations to them. 
And I'm just showing off a bit here, but they printed this, you know. Um, the first is from M. Albrook, Corley Sussex, aged 13 years. He writes blah, blah, blah. And then, at the end, he says, um, and on the opposite side to the tail, a faint streak of light extended like a beard. That's this thing that I drew. That was really puzzling, because I read that comet tails always point away from the sun. They don't point behind the comet, because in space there's no air resistance. They point away from the sun. So what was that thing doing? I'd never seen that before, but I drew it and I wrote about it. Of course, other people saw it too, but for me that was a discovery. And I want to make the point that astronomy is a great science for kids, because you, are, you can discover things, actually, as a kid, you can discover something. Um, it's harder now, but it's really hard here because the sky is so polluted, unfortunately, with light from Chicago and everywhere. And uh, there's an organization called the International Dark Skies Association, and I recommend that you you join that just to give them some subscription money because they're, they're supporting areas of the country where you can go and actually see really dark skies. I could go out of my house and see the Milky Way on those jet lights just like that. So what is this thing doing here? Here's a photograph. And you see here a little sun with spike. It only been seen once before on a comet about 100 years before. Um, it's a very odd phenomenon. But what it is, is dust particles that come off the comet and they're they're not grains of sand, they're smaller than that, but they they don't suffer from the radiation pressure like the, the gas and, 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 and that, that does this tail. And as the comet goes around in its orbit, it leaves this trail of, of dust and small grains behind it. And by perspective, here's a diagram, here's, here's it's not to scale, but the Earth is here, the Sun is here, the comet is here, and this dust left in the orbit, you can see it looking in front. And you only see it rarely. The next day it was gone. Because you only see it when the Earth is in the same plane as the orbit of the comet. But that dust trail that comets do leave, they give rise to what? Meteor showers, right? When you see a meteor in the sky, zipping across, um, it's, it's the grains of dust, and grains of sand even smaller, that come into the atmosphere than the debris of a comet. Who's looked at the Perseid meteors? Many of you probably, it's the most famous shower because every August the Earth passes through this dust trail that's been left by the comet a long time ago. We pass through it every August. And sometimes you can see quite a lot. And, and the story about the purse is because this year actually I was uh, just 13 and I would go outside the house like one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning to see the purses and write down them. And I did that once uh, when I when I was 13, and I left the house front door just a bit open. Um, so, and then I went out, found a good place to lie on the ground, and look at the sky, and I saw a dozen meters in that hour, and I was getting cold. And I went back and found the door was shut. So um, I didn't want to wake the parents up at 2 o'clock in the morning, but I found I could break in through, I could break into the house through, actually had a dustbin covered I could get in through. I got in, and I, it changed the furniture. <coughs> I went to the house next door. Identical <laughs> <laughs> house. <laughs> and I crept out, you know, and it crept out. I never told my broke into the house at two o'clock in the morning. And if you don't do that in this country, because you had been shot in this country. <laughs> but anyway, so it's a, that's a story, but it's great, great hobby for kids. And uh, the other thing, much later, I. Um, this is back to planet hunting. I never saw Neptune with my own eyes. But I did find it on a photograph I took much later when I was living in Geneva, Switzerland, working at CERN. There you could go up for a half an hour, you could be above the bit, above the haze, and, and uh, took photographs. So this is a photograph I took of the Milky Way with an uh, exposure like 10 minutes or so. And uh, I could find that, I, I found Neptune on this, but I, I never, only because I knew where it was, you know, from, from tables and so on. But uh, after I finished my bachelor's degree, uh, decided to physics major, I had to decide whether to do particle physics or astronomy. I said to myself, if I do uh, astronomy, I can't be an amateur particle physicist, but if I do a particle physics profession, I can be an amateur astronomer. That's the way it works. <laughs> so now about planets. So this is our own solar system, and you're probably pretty familiar with this. Um, not to scale, Distance is not a scale, but the size of the planets are. And this is the sun. Look how small the Earth is 
I have Peter Sattler's compared with the Earth, Mercury, I have Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. I still have Pluto there, but now it's unfortunately sort of demoted to what's called a dwarf, because there are many other such objects around there in the solar system that we've discovered, similar sizes actually. Um, and here you see on the bottom this distance scale. This is a, a linear scale showing the distances from the sun in what's called astronomical units. The astronomical unit is not a very fundamental scale. It's the rough distance between the Earth and the sun. So that's one astronomical unit. So the Earth is at one astronomical unit. Mercury and Venus are even closer. Mars is here. But then you have to go far out to Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. And these are where Pluto's got a band here because it's in a very elongated orbit. It comes in closer and goes up farther. And here's some other dwarf planets that have been found. And our Voyager spacecraft is now way off the scale of here. It's gone way, way past Pluto. And so the New Horizons you may have heard of on January the 1st, it went past this Ultima Thule object, which is a, only two tectonic rocks stuck together. Um, so now they're out, going out into the far, far reaches. So there's lots more things in the solar system, like many minor planets or asteroids. These planets most have moons. Um, some many have moons, and comets and dust and gases on. Comets sort of live out here, and they get um, sent in by um, uh, some gra close gravitational encounter closer to the sun. Um, so now, but now we found thousands of planets around other stars, and this is all happening in in, in our lifetimes for most of us, um, because it's all happened in the last 20, 25 years. This is the number of exoplanets detected. Um, year by year. So you see the first ones around here, we started detecting them. The different, um, the different colors are showing different ways of discovering these planets, and that's what I'm going to be talking about mainly. And now you see the green here is taken off. These are called transits, when the planet goes in front of the star and gives its light a little bit. And I'll talk about those first, and then, the, uh, then we have the next biggest chunk, these red ones, is called radial velocity, where you can actually see that the star is wobbling because the planet's going around it and pulling and pulling it. Okay. So um, this has been an explosion in the last few years, thanks to mainly the Kepler Space uh, Telescope. So this is another way of showing in a pie chart that most of the planets here are found by transits, thanks to new space telescopes mainly. And, and then these radio velocity ones and others from other ways. But now, as of two weeks ago, the latest news I had was we found 3,891 confirmed exoplanets. We're nearly 4,000. Maybe we get to 4,000 very, very quickly. But then there's another 2,500 or so that are candidates. They're possible, but they need to be confirmed to be really sure. And then they're classified as exoplanets, planets around other stars. And it's amazing how we can do this. And that's what I trying to give you an indication of. So, um, so I will show you some beautiful pictures, but they're of course artist impressions, because we've never been to one of these exoplanets and seen them like that. Um, oh, I see we've got this, this screwed up, screwed up on top here, but this is, it says, if you can't read it, the scene on exoplanet Trappist 1F, artist impression, of course. I won't always say artist impression, but they always are. And here you see that this is a system of planets around a star called Trappist-1. Um, the planets are given a letter, B, C, D, E, F, from the distance from the star. They don't give it A, because they might find one closer in later, so they leave A out and go B. So F is the fifth one out from the star. And these are showing other, other planets. You wouldn't actually see them that size uh, from the sky. They're not that close, probably. But 1F is one that we think could have liquid water on it, could have seas on it. So it's potentially a place where life could be. So first, uh, let me talk about the first method. Um, it's not the first one historically, but it's the most important one, transit. So, um, has everybody seen a transit of Venus? Not you have, right? I don't see transit of Mercury. Uh, no. Um, uh, that's rarer. Actually, at, at Kepler, and we named this planet finding uh, telescope after him. He predicted first that Mercury and Venus should sometimes pass in front of the face of the sun. 
And if the angel was from you would never notice that. You wouldn't notice it, you don't look at the sun, right? And, and you should never look at the sun directly with your eye, except in total eclipse. But uh, otherwise, he predicted that. And then he, the first transit of Mercury was predicted to see in November 1531 by SMG. And we've been able to time successive precision transits very precisely to get the orbit of Mercury very precisely. Um, and we find that the orbit precesses, that is, it's not perfectly circular, it's like an ellipse, and, it, and the ellipse turn, rotates only about 41 seconds of arc per century, a very little bit. But that wasn't explained by Newton's law of gravity, um, and so it's a puzzle. And some people had a theory that it was due to another planet called Vulcan, um, that was closer in the Mercury and therefore always looked close to the Sun. We couldn't see it because it was too close to the Sun, but there it was, perturbing the orbit of Mercury. <coughs> now that, that, that was an idea, um, and here's a diagram of 1846 that shows where Vulcan might be, but it wasn't true, it wasn't right. Um, this rotation of Mercury's uh, orbit was explained finally by Einstein when he had a general theory of relativity in 1916, and that explained it, he, he calculated that it should be doing exactly that precession, which was a triumph of that theory. Which, by the way, you need that theory to do GPS to find out where you are, because if you didn't correct the general relativity, you'd go to the wrong party or something. Um, so, uh, here's a picture of the transit of Venus in 2012. Um, here it is, it's actually from this, this uh, space telescope, but, but it, it, it could you could do this with, with, with uh, the see them yourself with, by projecting the image of the sun on a, on a car. That's a good way of doing it or looking for a really dark filter. Now, if you missed the previous one in 2004, no, that, the one before was in 2004. This was 2012. Only eight years apart. The next is not until 2117, so many of us won't be there still for that. But because they come in pairs, two, and then a long time later, another two. But you calculate using these at distance from the Earth to the Sun. Actually, in 1771, um, an astronomer calculated using this eclipse of this uh, transit of Venus that um, that uh, the distance from the Earth to the Sun was about 153 million kilometers, and he got it right to within one or two percent, actually, already back then, using this precision measurement of the thing. Now, you see when the, when the planet goes in front of the sun, the light of the sun is dimmed because it's a little bit covered. And the light dimming, in this case, is 0.1%. It's, it's uh, you know, one part of a thousand. So you need to measure the light pretty well to see that, but that's not hard these days. That's very easy these days, actually. And um, so this is the way most exoplanets are found by the light dimming. Um, here's um, and one, when the, when the a planet transits in front of the star, the sun in this case, or the star, some of the sunlight comes through the atmosphere around the edge of the planet, which has got one. Was that a question you had? Oh, yes. Yeah. You had Oh, sorry, thank you, that's important. So there are some other little black marks here. These are sunspots, right, which are regions of the sun they're not black, they're actually very bright, but they look dark compared to the rest of the sun because they're cooler regions, they're called sunspots, and they're to do with motions in the atmosphere of the sun. And they're big, I mean, this one is bigger than the Earth, the whole Earth, actually, but it's a sort of a, a, a and, and they, the sun is, is um, the sun is uh, rotating, and uh, as you, you, you can see, I, I was doing this as a kid, looking at, plotting the position day by day, you see it moving across the sun, they come and go, but of course, they are a problem for finding planets this way because they already dim the sun a little bit. There's a little bit less light because they're sunspots. So you have to take into account what you know about the star spots or sunspots on other stars. Um, so that is a, is a complication. But what one does is you see, you look at a star, you measure the light intensity precisely, and then you see that it dims for a little while as as the planet moves across the, the, across the front, because the planet's in orbit around the sun. And then it comes back, the light comes back. And by measuring the, the amount of light dimming, you can see what the relative size of the planet and the star is. So you get some already idea of the size of the planets. I'll, I'll come more to that, but 
Here is um, so some planets have atmospheres. Maybe all planets have atmospheres. This is a Venus's atmosphere. From the Earth, Venus just pretty well looks like a bright silvery object. But this is this is um, showing the surface of the atmosphere. It's enhanced. It's mostly carbon dioxide. There's some hydrogen there. And we can tell that from the light spectrum, the spectrum of light reflected on the planet. Um, and when now here's you, you probably most of you have seen a total lunar eclipse, right? A total lunar eclipse, because you can see them when you, if the moon is in eclipse. That is when uh, the, it's a transit of the sun by the Earth, in a way. If you're standing on the moon and you see the Earth and it moves in front of the sun, it's big enough to just cover the sun, and that gives you a total eclipse. Um, uh, and, and that lasts for, uh, depends, but it can last for half an hour, an hour. And you see it's reddish, and it depends sometimes it's more reddish than other times. The reason it's reddish is the same reason that the sky, the, the sky is, dark, is red at night sometimes, because the sun emits all colors of light, of course, and the blue light is scattered by the atmosphere. That's why the sky is blue on a nice day. It's the light being scattered out, leaving more red light. So uh, when the sun is setting here, or rising, the blue light is scattered out, but the red light is, comes through. And so when you're standing on the moon, and there's a total eclipse of the sun, um, no, sorry, it's not a total lunar eclipse, but for you on the moon, it's an eclipse of the sun. The Earth passes by, and the reddish light is because of the atmosphere. So this shows that light passing through the atmosphere of a planet, when it goes in front of the sun, uh, the star, um, is uh, trans can be transmitted through the atmosphere. And this is the way we can, in principle, discover the composition planets around other stars, even though they're much too small to, to see them. Um, and here is, here is an artist's impression, again, of a planet called, it's nicknamed Osiris. It's, um, it's passing in front of, of the star in this, in this picture. It was the first exoplanet found by this method of transit, using the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's called a hot Jupiter. It's big, it's very big. Of course, the bigger they are, the easier they are to find this way, because they've got more of the star light. 15% light giving in this case, not like 0.1% which it was for Venus. It's big and it's close to the star. And it's blowing off hydrogen because it's so hot, close to the star, the heat is blowing off the atmosphere. And they estimate about 10,000 tons per second of hydrogen is being blown off this star. And sodium too, they can see that in the, in the spectra. And detected through these uh, oxygen too. And, um, there's a, a term called Thonian planets, which would be like Jupiter, but when the whole atmosphere has been blown off by the sun, because, by the star, because it's close in, and then you rest left with the sort of uh, rocky center, or solid center, whatever. That's um, so a Thonian planet. I don't know that we really have. Um, but, um, so here's the Hubble Space Telescope. As you know, Hubble was from Wheaton, um, and, was, and uh, he, this telescope, of course, he didn't make that. <laughs> he discovered the expansion of the universe by looking at distant galaxies. But this telescope was named in his honor. Um, and this is a, a picture of it as a photograph taken in space from the space shuttle that was moving apart from that. And um, it was, um, it still, it, twi it wasn't expected to last nearly as long. It's 28 years since it was put up there. It's switched on right now. They, they have problems with gyroscopes. So, and they're trying to figure out a way they can still continue some observations with it, um, even though it's way past its, uh, its shelf, shelf time. But brilliant thing. And this is a, this is a shade uh, at the top here that can close, close it. There's a telescope that there, solar panels and so on. And it's done a brilliant job at discovering so many things. Um, this is a, a exoplanet called Tress 3b. I mean, that's the size of it. We don't really know what it looks like in detail. But it's close into the star. It's bigger than Jupiter, as you see. Close into the star. It goes around the star in only 31 hours. So it's zipping around. It's close in. It's one of hot Jupiter, the large closer sky. And it's found by the transit method, this transit method explorer survey. Now, um, the transit, it's, it's easy to find relatively by the transit method. I mean, because if you can measure that 15% dimming of the star but as it poses in front. Now, of course, the percentage of dimming doesn't depend how close the star is to you. It could be, it could be the other side of the galaxy. The percentage dimming is the same, but you need enough light to be able to measure or uh, change that that much. 
This little graph on the right here is, um, is, is, a, is, is radial velocity. We'll confirm this. Now, I'll come to that later after I finish talking about transits. Um, but the star itself is wobbling backwards and forwards because, you know, a planet doesn't go around the center of the star. Which doesn't move. The star moves, they, they go around the common center of gravity. So as the planet goes around, the star wobbles to near, and the sun, our sun wobbles because of the planets going round it. And I'll mention that wobbling later when I talk about radial velocity uh, measurements. So this is a, this is a, and now this is uh, the next great telescope, the Kepler Space Telescope, which, is, um, which has got a sort of super duper a digital camera, this is a digital camera, there's 90, uh, 95 million pixels on this camera, so it's a terrific camera, and it's designed to, to measure, to look for exoplanets by the transit method. Um, the, the, the goal was to have a precision, not of 1% or 0.1%, but 20 parts per million of the, of, the, uh, of the sunlight. That would be the sunlight star for a six hour back integration. And it's continuously monitoring 150,000 main sequence stars. So it looks at a part of the sky, it's looking away from the center of the galaxy. Because the idea is that maybe planets with planets that have good conditions for life, that could have liquid water on them, are more likely to be about the distance from the center of the galaxy than we are, not right in close, where there's too many stars to disrupt things and so on. So I'll show you the, where they're looking. They're not looking, and then it never points to the sun. Or Course, uh, but it's uh, so here's where it, it's looking. So here's a, a sketch of the Milky Way galaxy. Of course, not the, and nobody's out there looking at it on the outside. But it's it's like this uh, structure. Here's the high density region, and we're out here in one of the suburbs, if you like, the remote spiral arm of, of, the, of the galaxy. And these are different arms of, of the, this is sort of the Sagittarius arm where the Milky Way is particularly bright and Sagittarius, which is Southern Hemisphere, you see it better. But we're look, this telescope is looking over in this direction, but out to 300,000 light years. Okay, so the nearest star is about four light years away. And then, of course, if you can look out 3,000 light years, the volume is, is, uh, it, it is well over you know, 100 million times bigger. So that's many more planets. Of course, the further away they are, the harder they are to find. But we're pointing in this direction, the Milky Way, but off. A bit towards in the Milky Way, but away from the direction of the sun. And the idea is this: yes, habitability is related to the distance from the center. This is the, and you know we, we can't look everywhere, so they, they focus there. They're still, still, still looking at these 150,000 stars, looking at them all the time. There's no night up there. I mean, it's night all the time if you look at the sun doesn't set. It's the out sound in space, so it can look continuously, which is very important when you look at these transits. You want to be able to see it turning on and turning off without interruption. And here's an example. This is the first rocky planet discovered by this Kepler uh, telescope. And that's an artist's impression of it, but it's, it's only 1.4 times Earth size. That's, and, and three times the mass of the Earth. Of course, if you cube 1.4, you get about three. And scorching hot, because it's close in. Um, 10b means it's the closest to the star that we um, have found. We, we could be, and then another one would be A. Um, a, a is this, but, but uh, and here you see the light curve. You see the brightness relative to normally it's one. I mean, just normalized to one. So one would be no change, but then it dips a bit and comes back up again. And here you see this is 0.9995, so 99.95 percent. So the the drop is only 0.01 percent, but we can see that with with. Um, with these precision measurements. And you see when it comes on, when it comes off, and um, it's scorching hot because it's so close to the sun. It's going around off, it makes it easier to find. So it's scorching hot. Uh, there would be water on there. Maybe oceans of molten rock, molten lava, maybe rivers, whatever. But it's much, much hotter than the Earth. But this is, uh, this is uh, the first rocky planet because it was first about big things like Jupiter's. Uh, this is recent, very really recent news um, from October last year, um, maybe something um, since then. So first evidence for a moon orbiting a planet, moon 
So it, 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 there was a double depth, if you like. There was a dip and a little dip on top of it. And you can see there were two objects close together. And a tiny dip and a tiny pause on the planet's orbit as well. One can see that. So although this system is bigger than the Earth-Moon system, the ratio is about, is about the same in the ratio of masses to the Earth-Moon. So it's a big planet and a big moon. But that was the first moon discovered <coughs> around an uh, exoplanet. Um, and now, Goldilocks zone, this is important, Goldilocks zone, because you know, Goldilocks zone is a region uh, around the star where liquid water could exist. It's not too hot, not too cold, Mercury's too hot, um, and uh, you know, Venus is too cold, uh, but uh, we think that it's likely that life um, needs to have something like uh, a temperature of liquid water to at least get started. We, we know we have excellent, we have hot life living in hot environments here, but most likely places where the planet is just right to have liquid water, and also probably um, like a region where, where like a sea with a beach, where you have solid liquid and gas uh, all together. But anyway, this, this is the, I'll talk a bit about life. Scott talked a lot about more. This is a possible water world, Kepler 22b, Kepler because it was a Kepler space telescope. Um, 22 is the system, and then B is, of course, the closest planet in, a possible water world. Artist impression. They've got some great artists, at, uh, I think, is at their NASA, actually, but they do really nice jobs of imagining what these planets would look like if you were up close. And here, another Kepler, 26b, which is uh, a very interesting system because it's a binary star with two stars going around each other. They're quite a few a binary stars in the galaxy. And here's a planet orbiting the two stars. So you can imagine if we had not only the sun, but another sun in the sky, that makes life complicated, right? And, and also it makes the orbit complicated, so and not necessarily so, st so stable. But, um, but this was a very interesting discovery to see that. And then now Kepler 11, the system here, this impression, the planets wouldn't all look that big from where any particular part, but it's the first compact multi-planet system discovered by Kepler. So as you looked at the star's light, you saw dips, dips, dips on top of dips, and you could unravel it and just and find that there are actually at least five planets, maybe some more that are lighter. But they're closer in the Mercury, they're very close to the star. Um, and as I said, the percentage dipping doesn't depend on how far away the star is, but it needs to be you know, bright enough uh, in the sky to be able to measure these, these light very precisely. And here's, here's another screw up in the fog, so this is Trappist-1. Who's heard of Trappist-1? It's one of the most famous, uh, because there's at least seven planets around this star, and at least three of them seem to be in the Goldilocks zone. Um, and this is an artist sketch of two planets in front, and actually that, that sometimes happens, because there are many of them. And uh, the NASA, in this case, the Spitzer Space Telescope, um, made these observations, space continuous observations, to found all these planets. So here are the seven planets, their relative sizes, not distances, of course, they're all spread out in distance, but these, they're all similar size, not too big, um, and two or three of them with, are in the Goldilocks zone. Not only the intensity of the light and heat coming from the star, which we can measure, and the distance of the planet from the star, which we can measure, then you can calculate how much starlight is falling on the star, and how bright the sun would be, the star would be if you're there, and how hot it's going to be. And for these two or three planets, the temperature can be around what it is now outside here with a plus or minus 50 degrees or so. So that's, um, and here's a nice uh, artist impression of one of the icy, icy planets uh, around Trappist 1. Uh, I have a video, but I couldn't find the way to put that here. Maybe, so. Um, so I want to shout out for this NASA Spitz Space Telescope. And also, there's a ground based system called Trappist. Transiting planets and planetaries with a small telescope. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and this is actually several that measure the look of these transits. And it's been going for, it was planned for five years, but it's 25 years of counting. And this telescope detected water vapor in an atmosphere. Th these are, it, it looks actually at um, infrared, infrared light mainly. And this is the wavelength, uh, the light. And it, it finds items in the spectrum 
that they're showing that there's water vapor in the atmosphere as these planets transit. So we have discovered water vapor in, in these planets. That was uh, only last year, I think, that that was first detected. Um, and this is, uh, 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 well, that's a picture of the Trappist telescope in outer space. Um, and then this, this particular star here, WASP 39b, it's, uh, it's 700 light years away in Virgo. It's on a four day orbit, so it's going around the sun. It's very close, but it's low density. And so it's largely uh, able to put a lot of water in. That's interesting. So he, he, and here's a, eight planets known around this sun like star. It's called a G type star, eight planets. And these are relative sizes, some are huge. And this is the solar system. So here's Jupiter. So these, this is bigger than Jupiter. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Earth here, and you see the, these are larger. But not, yes, not the solar system known to have big planets, like the solar system. They're all close to the star of the Earth. It's probably too hot for water of life. But there may be cooler ones out there further away that we just have seen because, you know, they're smaller, they're further enough away, they don't orbit so often, they don't pass the transit so often. Of course, you realize that this transit method is brilliant, but it can really only detect planets when the orbital plane, like the solar system plane, is looking at it. Because mostly, you have a planet, a star, a star with planets going around it, but they go, they, they go around like this, and not like this, you see. It has to be going in front of the star. So, as it happens, most planets go in the same sort of orbital plane, like in our solar system. But if the orbital plane is, is, is off, I mean, Venus, does pass in front of the star sun very often, as you saw, um, because it usually passes above or below. But um, and, and you can only detect the planets that actually pass right in front of the star. So it's very inefficient, but you can look at 150,000 stars and find those that happen to have the orbital plane in the correct orientation. Front. Mike, it's like why we don't have an eclipse of the moon every month, right? Exactly the same thing, yeah. So, so the yes, the moon goes in orbit once a month, and usually it passes above the sun or below the sun, and only occasionally, rarely, does it pass, well, occasionally it passes in front of the sun, we'll have an eclipse. But then the moon's shadow is relatively small on the Earth, and only if you're right in the center of the moon's shadow does it come in, because that means you get a total eclipse. Worth, worth um, seeing if you haven't seen one. So here it now is, this is a bit old, but it doesn't matter, because end of December, a bit over a year ago, this chart was made. Now, I have to explain this diagram, because we've got two axes here. So along, along this, this direction is the period of the orbit. One day, 10 days, it's a logarithmic scale. So one, 10, 100,000, right? So our Earth's uh, um, orbit is um, one year, it's, it's, it's here, right? And then this is the size of the planet compared to the size of the Earth. So one is the size of the Earth. This is four times, 10 times, it's also a logarithmic scale. Every dot here is a planet that we knew about at that date, and we knew that its, sun, its size, roughly, relative to the of the Earth, Earth is one. So the Earth is here, and all these other planets, and the yellow ones were found by transit, and the, um, the bluish ones were found by, um, before Kepler, by, um, by, by wobbling the star. So you see, it's easy to find it wobbling if it's a very massive star, a very big star. But planets can find smaller ones. But not yet, as of this time, planets that are as small as the Earth and in the same orbital period, like one year, whatever is one year for us. But with this number, and knowing the number of stars you've looked at, and been able to see transits, calculating for the ones you couldn't see, you're going to figure out that probably every star just about in our galaxy has got planets. Um, some planets may be maybe one, two, maybe 10, whatever. <coughs> so, and we know, if you look at the Milky Way, which is made up of billions of stars so faint that they all merge together to the eye and so on, we know that there's about 100,000 million, 100 billion if you like, but I say 100,000 million stars in our galaxy, which means there's gonna be about 100,000 million planets in our galaxy too, right? And of course, not all of them would be uh, Goldilocks planets, but that's a huge number, a huge number. Interestingly, it's about the same number as the number of galaxies in our visible universe. And interestingly also, it's about the same number of neurons in your brain. I don't know, that's just a coincidence, I'm sure, but anyway, it's the whole big numbers. 
Um, so you see, most of them, and now, now I, I think in the last year, we have been populating this region a bit more and finding even, think, even, even smaller, smaller planets with larger orbits. Of course, if the orbit is too, if the orbit is, uh, takes too long, you know, like 100 years, we won't see it coming back. We'll only see one, and then it's not confirmed. So they need, I think they need to see it twice to be confirmed, which means you have to have fairly short orbit periods. And this is a chart back in, well, uh, last fall, of the exoplanets found and how far away they are from us. And the unit here is parsec, which is not a very fundamental unit, like meters and kilometers and so on, but it's used a lot in astronomy. A parsec is 3.36 light years, which is about three quarters of the way to the nearest star. Why is it called a parsec? Because, um, uh, because if you are a parsec, if, if, a, if the Earth's orbit, is, if the Earth was one parsec away, and you're looking from above, if you like, at the orbit, the size of the orbit is, whoops, um, is, uh, uh, it's parallax. It's a bit one second of arc, which is a second of arc, which is a sixtieth of a minute of arc, which is a sixtieth of a degree of arc. So that would be the size of the Earth's orbit. Astronomers use it because if a star, if a star is one parsec away, um, and you look at its position in the sky against a distant galaxy, it'll be doing a little curve, a little circle, especially if it's, if it's exactly uh, normal to the Earth's orbit. The Earth's orbit here, you look at a star in the 90 degree direction, perpendicular to it, and it's doing a little circle because the Earth is going around the sun. A little circle compared with the far distant galaxies. So at that distance of one parsec, a star is doing a little one second of arc circle, if you're looking at it directly like that. So this is, you see, this is 3,000 light years. I put light years here. So most of them are less than 3,000 light years away. We have found some even 1,000 light years, uh, even much further away um, uh, from brighter stars and so on. So we, we're getting there. As we get our better techniques, we will push that up. And here is just a, a picture because uh, stars are different sizes. Some are smaller, some are called, uh, uh, this is a relative size of so the sun here. Star stars are much smaller, low mass star. It's a thing called brown dwarf, which is a, 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 an old, coolish star compared with Jupiter. So there's discussion sometimes whether this is an object a brown dwarf or, or a hot Jupiter or whatever. Here's the size of the Earth in comparison. The sun is actually larger than that scale. Um, now, Hubble actually has spotted a, a giant planet orbiting a tiny star. It's very hard to do that, but um, this is a picture. Here, the star itself has been completely blanked out electronically, okay, blank it out. And this object here is a reflected light from the star, the brown dwarf star, on a planetary mass companion. So it's, it's a, a, a brown dwarf mass, 35 times Jupiter's mass. The companion is also heavy, it's 10 times Jupiter's mass. Is it, so is it a brown dwarf or a huge planet? It's a question of, well, let me continue up here. Okay, let me pause here. Um, I'm finished with the transit method for now, but I'm going to talk about radial velocity, which is another main way we do it. So, do you have questions uh, about, about that? Yeah? Was that last one showing a planet that was larger than the star that it was orbiting? Or was the star just smaller in comparison? Uh, the planet was smaller than the star it's orbiting. Yeah, smaller than that. I mean, yeah, so let's, let's go back here. In this case, yeah, I mean, oh, right, okay, good point. The planet, this is all fuzzed up, you know. It's, the, it's like, you know, a, a star is a point as far as you can see, but if you take it with an out of focus camera, it's fuzzy. The planet is actually um, not anything like that. You can't see the size of the planet. You just, it's just the light is spread, spread out, so don't think of it as being, as being anything. The size of that is the spread of the light in the, in the telescope and so on. So the planet is actually too, too small to see a size of it. You know, Mike, questions? Yes? Um, Mike Winter gave me this for a non-technical question. How do you think the uh, letters appeared on the top of your screen? 
What, those crazy letters? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's screwed up. Like, on my computer, look fine. You know, it's a different font. I use a different font, just sort of curly font. But this is actually given some crazy. This computer, I think, which we're using for this. It looks cover. Cyrillic or something, but I mean, how yeah. could they have gotten it? <laughs> that computer did not recognize the font that I put in it, did its own crazy font on that. So, so uh, yes. <laughs> thank you. Here's I, a question. Uh, just a minor uh, comment about the quote, just right conditions of illumination yeah. of life. Uh, recently, um, classification of life, arachia, um, bacteria, and eukaryotes have changed a lot of the paradigm for the conditions for formation of life and binding of life in very, very hot climates and very, very cold. Climates. It's, it's a little different, I think, the, the acceptance of Stanley Miller's experiments, the green soup type theory. So the just right conditions for formation of life, I think, in the past 20 years, particularly with Carl Woos's investigations, have sort of changed things. It's a, it's a minor comment relative to yeah, what I, you're looking at it on a macro yeah. level. Is uh, an astrophysicist, but yeah, I think that's just rather correct. And I'm not a biologist. I, my understanding is that once life had started on Earth, and it started probably, you know, with, with the first cells that joined together, make more complex cells, then it diverged, and we now have life that can live in deep hot rocks and icy conditions, and so on and so forth. But um, when we will understand how life actually could get started with the first complex molecules that we produced. Probably, if it was all the temperature of molten lead, it would never happen. Or if it was all the temperature of liquid nitrogen, it probably would never happen. So probably it needs to be somewhere there. But anyway, that's where the, the betting is now. So you're right, it could, it could be different. Because some of the Iraqi, I think, are back 3.5 billion years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, um, any other questions? Just a quick, quick comment for you. Yeah. The A designation you mentioned, I believe that's the uh, star itself. Uh, which, which, which you, when, when you've got the planets B, C, D, E, F, oh, yes. A, A is the star. Oh, is that right? Is that right? I, I, I believe so. Okay, maybe I misunderstood. I thought they left A out because there might be another. Okay, all right, that, that may be correct. Thank you for the correction. That's right. Okay, so let me move on to radial velocity, which is actually the first one. So here's, here's a bit of, sort of physics that you probably want to know. So Isaac Newton, way back in um, 1572, he let a beam of light, sunlight, come through into his dark laboratory and he put a prism of glass there and found that light split into different colours, like a rainbow. A rainbow does the same sort of thing because the glass has different refractive index and different colours. So he showed that the white light of the sun is actually a spread of colours. That is a spectrum. And then later, um, an image came from Wollaston and they noticed that there were, in the sunlight spectrum, when you spread it out, there were dark lines, and Fraunhofer later rediscovered that and studied it systematically. He did a chart of the who did that. And, and if you spread out the light with a, with a precise spectrograph, you can see these lines. The lines are due to um, <coughs> cooler elements and gases in the outer atmosphere of the star absorbing light just as those wavelengths, and it's due to the atomic structure, which we don't have time to go into. Um, and then you have bright lines of emission. Where the in, in a, in a, when you have bright lines and, and dark lines. And helium, the gas helium, you have the was discovered in the sun. That's why it's called helium, because Greek the sun is helios, discovered by by the Lockyer. And I put this here in pictures because I want you to notice how different physicists looked then for now. <laughs> okay, this is a picture that I took at a, at a, a workshop uh, last year at Dark Matter and Arc Energy, and this is typical one day physics, we don't look that much anymore. Um, okay, so here's the radial velocity moment. When, uh, as the moon goes around the Earth, but actually the moon and the Earth both go around the center of gravity, so as the moon goes around, the Earth also goes in a small wobble, and the ratio of wobbles is to the ratio of masses. But when planets go around the star, the star also reacts wobbly, because um, it's the, what stays still, basically, is the, is the center of gravity of the system. Um, so, um, and it, I think you all know about the Doppler shift. When things are going uh, far, far away, the light is slightly redder. When they're coming towards you, it's slightly bluer. The same sort of principle as in sound. When you're standing by 
uh, highway and the car goes by and meow, meow, that's the high note, go to the low note, change of frequency because uh, they're coming towards. It's not the same thing quite because uh, speed of sound and feet like this. But anyway, um, we can measure this velocity, the radial velocity by measuring how those lines in the spectrum shift left or right towards the blue or towards the red. And this is how the universe expansion was discovered. But um, this is a project called Hearts High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher. Um, and um, it's, there's a mountaintop in Chile because that's where you want clear skies, dark skies, free telescope, and it's got this very precise uh, instrument for measuring very precisely these, um, these um, wavelengths. And, and it's, it's so amazingly precise that you can actually measure the star wobbling by a few meters per second towards your away from you. That's incredible. And part of that is due to this man, Ted Hedge, who was a Cape Ferdinand, and gave a seminar about this. He got the Nobel Prize later, um, and I was honored to uh, meet him. We had him out for dinner, it was great. And I, I can't explain in detail the method, but it's, it's very clever. But if you have two notes, two notes, uh, that are perfect sideways, but with slightly different frequencies, you add them together, you get a beat, you get the sum, it gets, some places they add together and give you a big amplitude, some places they cancel, get the small one. So you get sort of beating, like wow, 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 and mm -hmm. like. And then um, this uh, Hench and colleagues invented an optical frequency cone device that has a, like a laser, and you put it between two mirrors, and you're able to get, to get this, uh, this sort of beat, beating and make a, a, like a comb of, of different frequencies. Um, very precise. So precise that you can actually spread out the spectrum um, and all these, all, it, it, into a, what's called a comb. Can't describe it, I don't, it's hard to understand. I, I tried to find a way of explaining it. But the precision you get in the radio velocities is better than two centimeters per second. Okay, by comparison, the amplitude of the radial velocity of the sun by the Earth going around, the Earth goes around, and the sun wobbles once a year, nine centimeters per second. Okay, um, that's the amplitude when it's. Uh, so the new laser frequency codes, in principle, enable the detection of Earth-like planets in Earth-like or orbits. Um, and here's an example of a system that where we have found three planets. This is the. This is the uh, radial velocity. And it's complicated, you see. It's got ups and downs, and not a single sine wave, but it can be decomposed. It can be decomposed into uh, different frequencies by subtracting out the other two. And this way, you're seeing the signal as reconstructed after subtracting out the ones you know about, showing three planets with periods of about nine days, 31 days, 197 days, all a bit closer. In the uh, shorter than our, our bit, but you see the sort of precision you can get. And the longer you can measure this, the more precise you can get these, this information. So that was about all I was going to say about radial velocity, but it's very important that time is getting on, I see. So uh, gravitational lensing is another one that's really coming along and very interesting. But um, what happens is that if you have a, we're on the Earth here, and here's a star far, far, far away. But in front of it, there is another star, and Einstein's theory of gravity says that light is bent when it goes around stars. And in fact, the, the great observation of the eclipse in 1919, I think it was, showing the sun also um, lenses, if you like, the star field behind it. But this is, uh, it's rare that it happens a star moves in front, a star with a planet moves in front of us, one of these stars. But here's the light curve, very precise, of the star, and the, and the light brightens a bit, and then it dims, and then it brightens again, and this curve is calculated, that, that's, a, that's a zooming in on this curve. The light gets brighter as the star in front is lensing it, and then it gets fainter again. But at the peak here, you see a little dip, uh, and, and this can actually infer they discovered a cold super-Earth planet um, 
uh, orbiting a low mass star, blah, blah, blah. And so um, this is another way of seeing stars by micro-lensing using gravity. And then what about direct observation? We see these things. I showed one that was um, a potentially observation. Here's another one now, another exoplanet. This is the first discovered planet around a particular star that's been totally blocked out. And this is really a point of light, but the, the, the size of that blob is from the optics uh, because it's not, you know, it's a, it's a pixelation there. But this is the first to be seen by the sphere. Um, EOSO is European Sun Observatory, it's a very large telescope. Um, and uh, the circle, oh, sorry, the circle indicates the size of the orbit of Neptune. So it's way farther out from the Sun, which makes it somewhat easier to see. And, and uh, the next one I'm showing is actually um, another star that, where the star has been blocked out again, but there are three spots that indicate light coming from planets. As I say, they're, they're point light, but they're spread out by the, by the instrument. Um, life, finally life. Well, we've had talks by Scott and so on about life. I just want to add a little bit about that, which is partly repetition. So, we're always interested, with so many planets in our galaxy, how many have, have life? Have life? And, uh, and so, how do you define life? I mean, I, you could define it as a complex molecule capable of self-reproduction, or a template for reproduction. Protein. Now, of all the elements in the periodic table, the only one that we know to be capable of such complexity is a carbon atom. It happens to have light properties. Um, if carbon wasn't there, maybe life, as we know it, would be something sort of possible. Now, people like silicon-based life, like you know, artificial intelligence, computers, and robots, they may take over the world, but that's not natural, so I'm not counting that. And presumably, that wouldn't evolve from scratch by itself. It would need it would need carbon-based life to actually invent the robots of that kind. So then, there's this Drake equation that you heard about, that's Victor Frank Drake. Um, it's, it's called a Fermi-type problem. How many, never mind, Fermi, Fermi had a great, he, he used to say, how many piano tuners are there in the city of Chicago? Now, how do you answer a question like that? He said, well, he said, well, we can figure it out, you know, roughly, you know, how many, uh, what's the population, you know, divide by two or three for the number of households, what fraction of households have a piano? You know, that's maybe a quarter or whatever it was. And then how often does the piano need tuning? And how often does it take piano to tune it? And he figured out how many piano tuners there should be in Chicago. And he was right with a factor of two or so. I mean, that's just an example of that way of thinking, which is very useful scientifically. So Drake said, how many, in this case, extraterrestrial intelligences might be detectable by listening for radio signals from them? Okay. So you have to multiply together lots of things that are either knowledge or guesses for each of these factors. You know, this all these factors. Now the first ones we actually have measured now. The average rate of star formation in our galaxy, we know how many stars are in our lifetime. The fraction of these stars that have planets, and now we think it's about one. The average number of planets that can potentially support life per star that has planets. What is it, 10%? I mean, we, we, we're getting to know that by measuring uh, the planets' compositions. And then you come to several that we don't know at all, really. Um, I think we don't know at all, but as we progress, we might know. A fraction of planets that could support life that actually develop life at some point, you know? Maybe many planets, the Goldilocks planets, that could support life, but it never happens. So maybe it could be, we don't know. There's a fraction of planets with life that actually go on to develop intelligent life, civilizations, because, you know, we don't think that, uh, that ants and, uh, and uh, alligators uh, have radius Anyway, the fraction of civilizations that develop a technology that releases detectable science of their existence in space, we just don't know that. Maybe civilizations don't, don't develop the technology or don't use it. And finally, and this is, I think, a very interesting one now, the length of time for which such civilizations release detectable signals into space. Partly, you know, how long do we actually radiate signals? How long does our civilization exist? It's going to, I mean, it's been relatively recent that we've actually, last you know, 135 years, been able to emit radio signals. Maybe we'll stop emitting them for some reason, or maybe our civilization will not last another 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 years. You know, um, we we could easily be transient, especially if we don't go totally um, renewable energy. Um, um, so we know the first three. 
we don't know the last word. So we know it's not exactly zero because we're here. So but we could be, we could actually be the only uh, advanced technological civilization in the galaxy. It's, it's certainly possible. And that is likely to be, we talked about that, right? Atmosphere. And here, by measuring planetary atmospheres, and we can, our atmosphere is actually affected by the life that we live. And if, if there was no life on this planet, the atmosphere would be different. And by measuring the atmospheres around planets during transits, we can um, probably say that indeed this, this planet has got life on it, even if we don't know what the kind of life it is. Atmospheres. This is the atmosphere of Mars. It's got a hazy, thin atmosphere. Jupiter's got a, a 5,000 kilometer deep atmosphere, if you like. It's almost a small atmosphere. Titan's got an atmosphere. Pluto, we can see that atmosphere from the spacecraft behind further out than Pluto, looking back, and Pluto was in front of the sun, we detected that there. So here, now, this is uh, the closest exoplanet we know, discovered in 2016, Proxima Central, Proxima means close to, so the constellation Centaurus, um, and it's close to the star, the star is cool and red, it could have liquid water oceans, artist impression. And now, look forward to James Webb Space Telescope. It's going to be a huge thing. It's planned for launch in 2021. It had problems, but um, funding issues and so on. But it's got these huge things, mirrors, that's the guy, and, and it's going to go up and, and um, will be able to measure the atmospheric compositions of many planets, I, I think. Um, and then SETI, you've heard of SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, listening to uh, perhaps radio signals from other, I, I think other civilizations might be wise to not broadcast anything to us, but uh, uh, we had a Fermi lab in my Giantata, again another one uh, last year, um, Fermi lab, she's a leader of this project, and now there's a James, the uh, Port Allo uh, array, and he's a, a very rich man who gave uh, more than 30 million for this project, and they've got lots of special array of telescopes. Um, and then there's SETI at Home, which if, you, if you're uh, interested in getting part of this project, you can join SETI at Home and use your computer when it's uh, not being used for anything else to search through <coughs> these signals and see if you can find some signals. Um, and I, almost my last slide, I've gone on too long, but this is a picture which is absolutely amazing. The Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the Hubble Telescope stared at a tiny part of the sky. Here's the size of the moon on the sky and the stars around, but it uses, I don't know if you can see that, it's a little, it's a little, uh, little uh, rectangle there, that's the area it's looking at, so no stars in our galaxy in that area, and that's the picture you blow up, and the light explosion of these four galaxies, out in that, four galaxies, and now you, that's only a tiny part of the sky, so if you look over the whole sky, if you were to, you'd realize we could literally be the same about everywhere, you know, 100,000 million galaxies, and uh, of course, uh, does that mean 100,000 million planets? We don't know, because way back the universe was much younger than the far depths of space, anyway. So what did I say? Uh, something like, Earth was once unique, this was the world, that was what, what we thought, that was it. Then, several planets in our solar system came to science. And then physics with telescopes and satellites, gravity wobbles by spectra, transits, gravity lensing. Now we know that we are only one of many thousands of planets. We've discovered thousands of planets already around other stars. Probably, surely, many billions of planets in our own Milky Way. And many billions maybe in the gold box there. It's really likely, in my opinion, in my opinion, that some form of life has originated in at least billions of planets. Um, I don't know that, that's what I think. We may know in your lifetime. But then, what are the chances of multicellular life then coming? and result in sentient creatures, some civilization, we don't know, okay, it could, it could be, we know it's not zero. We could even be alone in the galaxy, one of us wants to know that would be, but maybe, maybe there are more, out there, maybe there are many. And then maybe, uh, this is the last, maybe there are a huge number of universes as well, um, you know, we just don't know that either. And that, uh, and that uh, last thing got totally screwed up. I can't even remember what it said. Wow, wow. I said, wow. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions?
Uh, again, uh, just one uh, minor thing. The atmosphere of Jupiter uh, conceivably could uh, support Archaea as a life form, and we would pass uh, Saturn uh, and other planets. Uh, it's also conceivable that there could be an archaeological uh, evidence of dormant, primitive yeah. uh, evidence of life. Now, that doesn't translate into for complex multicellular uh, organisms type. Just, yeah. just to make that minor. Like, yeah, no, you're right. It could be, it could be like in some form in, in Jupiter, in a Titan moon, or a the sun. It's possible. Yeah, absolutely possible. Yeah. Uh, that, you could go with you can know. I mean, maybe we're trying to get Yeah, I don't think you're going to see humans not somewhere around. Not somewhere around. Something. Yeah, yeah, it could be like that. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's um, Because Jupiter, the last part of the Sun, which has an internal source of heat as well, like the Earth does, we have radioactivity in the Earth. So it's not, it's not, it could be quite warm when you go down there. Anything else? Any questions? Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. I don't know the total number because the we sun. Didn't hear the oh, sorry, the question is um, because I said the sun and the sun wobble because the planets are going round them. So they, they, they're not stationary with the planet going round, they also, uh, they also are going around in a small circle, smaller because their mass is so much bigger. So the question was about the, our sun and the planets going round. I didn't mention how much the sun wobbles because the Earth is going round it, but actually, it's, of course, all the other planets are going round it. So the sun's wobbling motion is, is, is complex. Actually, I've never, I've never looked at it. see the, the graph that shows the total sun wobbling. Um, and, and, but you can, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, you can calculate that very precisely, knowing the mass of all the planets. And then you could resolve this. That's a good point, though. It'd be interesting to say, you know, can you, have you looked at the sun and seen the wobbling and calculated the eight planets that we have from that? Good question. Yeah, I know. Um, I had a question about the radio velocity um, technique you talked about, and if uh, if a sun is moving a little bit more away than its wobble because of a planet, um, and therefore it's sending, we're, we're getting different frequencies from the light. Um, it's the change in its velocity that's producing the two different frequencies that are interfering to produce the beats, is that correct? Right, well, so the, the stars, all the stars are moving with some great speeds relative to each other. They're moving around the galaxy and right. so on. So it's not that the sun is sitting there and just wobbling. It's got a large velocity. So the wobbles are just on top of that. You have to subtract out the, the natural velocity and that the sun's going around the galaxy itself. So all, you have to subtract all that out. The wobbles then are on top of everything. Else. Right, but if it's going like six centimeters uh, per second more because of the wobble, yeah, it would, if it was just going at a constant six centimeters per second more, it would just send the same frequency all the time, right? It has to be changing to have the two different frequencies that interfere to produce the beats. Is that correct? It's coming towards you and going away from you. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I hope maybe I was. It was confusing to show this beat. The beat is in the laboratory with lasers that are slightly different frequencies to demonstrate the principle. The, 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 the light in the spectrum of the stars itself is not, is not a high frequency. It's, 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 it's got the wobble based on the stars orbiting around. So the period is very long. It, it, it's, uh, we, uh, it's minute changes in the Doppler shift. Yeah, it's minute changes in the Doppler shift, yes. And, uh, the, the precision able to, to subtract out the any continuous motion, but look at minute changes on the double ship in the line. And uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing, this frequency curve, but it's fascinating to do that. Yeah. Thanks. We've got some uh, NASA swag back here that got brought in kindly. So there's some stickers and some postcards with some fascinating views. So. Uh, 
On your way out, uh, is that to look at or to take? Take. To take. I don't want to Thank you so much. All right. So, good stuff to look at here. Mike, that was fascinating. Thank you so much.